Get ready to be blown away by the power of containers. This game-changing technology has revolutionized the world of cloud-native computing. And if you're new to containers, it is time to hop on board now. Containers have transformed the way we think about infrastructure, application design, development, and has even changed our job roles. It's changed our use of operating systems and the big one, especially with Kubernetes and tech companies, how we actually manage applications at scale. And by this, I mean running thousands of containers. In this video, I will completely cover how containers have had such a wide stream impact. And by the end of it, you'll have a thorough understanding of the history of virtualization and container technologies. By staying with me through this video, you'll learn about all of the special ingredients that modern solutions like Docker and Kubernetes depend upon. We'll start from the ground up covering the history of container technologies, starting with the early days of computing and IBM mainframe virtualization, which was one of the first historical examples of virtual machines. You'll learn about the introduction of Cheroot, short for change root, an important advancement for isolation of a root file system. FreeBSD and Jails, an early container-like technology. And then the era and growth of virtual machine computing with the likes of VMware. Stay with me here as this video will also showcase important components that you need to know about that make containerization possible, specifically Linux namespaces and C groups. You'll learn how containers use these to create isolated environments. We'll then finalize all of this with an overview of Docker. By the end of this, you'll have a solid foundation for getting hands-on with containers and we'll be ready to dive into their use. During the mainframe era, the IBM mainframe CP slash CMS operating system was a pioneering example of virtualization technology dating back to the 1960s. This system allowed multiple users to access and run their own virtualized instances of the operating system on a single mainframe computer, one of these beasts that you see in this picture, essentially allowing the mainframe to be shared amongst multiple users. This is one of the first widely available virtual machine architectures in the world. What was unique about this at the time, rather than actually time sharing resources, which was very common for that era, and the mainframe architecture, CP CMS provided each user with their own operating system virtualized within the machine. If we then fast forward to 1979, Cheroot was introduced in what was known as version 7 Unix. Cheroot, as the name implies, essentially allows you to change the root directory for a running process and its children, i.e. chap for change and root. For us, we can change the root directory for a process and its children. This enabled these processes and their children to only see the files and directories within the new root directory. And it also prevented them from accessing files and directories outside of it. As you can see from this, it was useful. However, it was limited. Common resources were still shared, so users, hostname, IP addresses would be visible and accessible inside the Cheroot environment. Whilst it had its limitations, it was useful to many and is still used today in many Linux offerings. Thanks for sticking with this so far as there's a lot of important history in fully understanding this. So next, FreeBSD and I absolutely love their logo. It means a lot to me as it was the first Unix system that I worked with professionally. FreeBSD is a free and open source operating system based on the Barclay software distribution, BSD version of Unix. Around the early 2000s, FreeBSD was heavily used across the globe, mostly by early internet service providers, which is where I was using it back 
a demon internet. It was popular because of its fantastic security, which of course is a necessity when you're a small business running an ISP. FreeBSD gained functionality known as jails in 2000, and this was a hot and exciting topic at the time. What you need to know is that a jail is a lightweight virtualization technology that allows for the creation of isolated environments within the FreeBSD operating system. Why is this important? A jail has its own set of system resources, such as network interfaces and process IDs, allowing many of these resources to exist on a single system without interfering with each other. If you have any container experience already, you'll sense that this sounds familiar to what Docker provides, and you'd be correct. FreeBSD jails, however, weren't user-friendly, and given the complexity of their common use, sadly, they didn't catch on and gain momentum. Now, here's an opportunity to take a trip down memory lane with me again, as both of these I was heavily involved in. In parallel, successful operating systems at the time, so your Sun Solaris and HP UX, were also attempting to virtualize and isolate compute resources. Some microsystems and Solaris tried to do this with zones, whilst HPUX attempted to do this with virtual partitions, also known as VPARs. Again, we can see even at this time, the market prevalence and overwhelming push for the ability to isolate compute resources was paramount. Now we get to the special ingredients that I referenced at the start. Around the same time, operating systems making use of the Linux kernel were gaining in popularity and were growing exponentially. In 2002, the Linux kernel added what is known as namespaces, and namespaces are a key ingredient for running containers today. Over 20 20 years on. The original namespaces were user, which provides a set of user IDs and group IDs in relation to processes. Remember that a standard user could therefore have root privileges within a namespace. PID, the process ID namespace. This provided independent process IDs across namespaces and the main system. We've got network. The network namespace provides an isolated network stack with its own IP addresses and connectivity the mount namespace, which allows the use of independent mount points that are visible by processes within the namespace. You can mount and unmount file systems in a namespace without conflicts. Then we've got UTS, the Unix time sharing namespace. This allows a namespace to have an independent host name and domain name, essentially its own identity. And the final ingredient in our culinary delight of Linux advancements, IPC, Interprocess Communication Namespace, essentially allowing the likes of POSIX messages to processes for exchange of data in the form of messages. It's a lot to cover and a lot to take in, so well done. And this moves us nicely onto the next area, which is what can be considered the seventh namespace, or in our case, the seventh ingredient. In fact, this is more than just an ingredient and could be considered the icing on the cake. Google C Groups. In 2006, engineers at Google started work on what was known as process containers, which were then later changed to control groups, or as we know them now, C Groups for short. And C Groups are considered another namespace, that vital seventh ingredient. These were merged into the Linux kernel in 2008 and provide the ability to isolate resource units. You've got resource limits. So this is how much of a resource, for example, how much CPU, memory, network, or IO can be used. We've got prioritization relating to resource limits, but the priority of a process allocation within a C group, i.e. this process has a higher priority than this process. You've We've got accounting, monitoring and reporting of resource limits. And you've got control, the ability to control processes in a group. So for example, started, stopped, frozen and restarted. 
You can see where this is going. When all of these ingredients are combined in Linux, we have the opportunity for complete resource isolation. Whilst these ingredients existed at the time, it wasn't user-friendly to use. Whilst we waited for the world to utilize these special ingredients, we had the rise of the era of virtual machines, and this took off and became popular in many ways. There were hypervisor solutions like VMware ESXi, which would allow you to carve up a system into virtual machines, each with their own isolated compute resource and their own operating systems. The traditional stack transitioned from what you see on the top right, hardware with an operating system on top and each application running on top of that operating system. This then moved to a virtual machine deployment. There were a number of players at the time, but VMware was and is very popular even today. You'd have the hypervisor, which allows multiple virtual machines to run on top. Visually, just looking at this, we can see the advantages that this brings, but also disadvantages. Let's start with the bad news first. The hardware is segmented, creating the disadvantage that resources may be segmented between different virtual machines. A further disadvantage, there's dependency on running and managing a hypervisor. Depending on the solution in question, this may be software that runs on top of an operating system or it may be the actual operating system itself. Each of these virtual machines then have their own guest operating system. So again, there's an additional overhead here. Depending on the operating system, there may be licensing implications, not to mention that these operating systems will need to be managed and maintained as part of our infrastructure. For example, with system patching and updates. However, the good news is that virtual machines were and are still very popular and have their place in many technology stacks. For example, Amazon EC2 is one of the biggest virtual machine offerings in the world. There can be advantages to using virtual machine infrastructure, such as advanced features, including live system migrations, support for GPUs and VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure. Now we're going to take a deep dive as we take a look at Docker, one of my favorite technologies that I proudly support as a Docker captain. Docker took the ingredients of namespaces and C groups and became a solution that fully brought containers to the mainstream. Docker started life in 2010 as Doc Cloud a cloud-based solution that later transitioned to Docker in 2013. You can see we have the hardware at the bottom, the operating system, and then on top of that, we have the container runtime. Notice the span of the container runtime being the same length as the hardware and operating system, highlighting how the container runtime maximizes the use of available resources. With this, we can then run containerized applications applications via the container runtime. There's no operating system layer for each container as the container shares the kernel of the main operating system. This is an advantage as we don't require a full operating system for each individual container. If you were to run some simple containers, for example, a Ubuntu or an AWS Linux container and were to run uname a to show the running kernel, despite each of these being their own operating system images, they would all show the same kernel output as it would be referencing the kernel of the main operating system. Each of the containers through the use of namespaces can have their own users, host names, IP addresses, mount points, and resource utilization. Through C groups, we can actually control the resources that are available. Where Docker was a differentiator to other approaches, not only did they make use of ingredients that were not widely used, they did so in a very friendly and consumable way that was one of the biggest hurdles with adoption. So now that you've reached the end of this video, you'll realize the wealth of knowledge on how virtualized computing has evolved, right the way through from the 1960s and 70s to today. Most importantly, you know how the likes of Docker and Kubernetes utilize namespaces 
and C groups to enable containerization. Brilliant. We'll be continuing our journey by diving more deeply into Docker and Kubernetes. Thanks so much for staying with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.